have, I'm going to refer to you with a lot of respect here, right? I can call you Dr. Oliver Carter, who's taken a more of an academic stance to making this film. It's not like a typical porn documentary. It's more about the man that's in it. First off, what did everyone think of the film? Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. 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 For me, I mean, having a campaign against censorship, it, it's brilliant producer. Yeah, this guy's a hero, as all sex workers are. Since my time in the army, even when we came back from Germany in 1982, we they turned us over at customs. Is how I got interested in fight against censorship. But all sex workers are heroes. I mean, going back to the time of poor old Mary Millington, who was driven to suicide by the police. Uh, they're heroes. They're true soldiers in their own way. We've got nothing to thank the establishment or the police for in, in the civil liberties that we enjoy today, as Ted just said on there. The, the right to enjoy the woman was won by the High Court case where they found it contravened the New York Court for Human Rights. And uh, but the establishment is still there. They're still trying with this RAF censorship and everything. They're still trying to continue censorship. The only way around this, in my opinion, in my modest opinion, would be to have a Bill of Rights update, the Magna Carta, as they say, where, where we have protection from the state. But the likes of Theresa May, Amber Rudd, etc., etc., it's the last thing they want because protection from the state empowers the individual, and empowering the individual is the last thing the British establishment want. We don't live in a de democracy, we live under the illusion of democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a very profound statement. Thank you very much. Can I just say that the, the, the term video nasties? was actually coined by a person in this very same room. Who is it, Terry? Yes. Uh, Do you want to give us the update on that? Yeah, very briefly. Um, I worked for a company called Video Space back in the uh, early 80s. And we were tied into uh, IPC Publications, which produced all the Women's Own and so on magazines. And we did a deal with them and we distributed videos. And we, they were weepies. So we called them video weepies, obviously. They were like, uh, Know, films which really sort of you know it's just romantic stuff and then my directors one day went down to Mifed or MIP or somewhere bought a load of cheap horror films and we had a brainstorming meeting one day and we said uh, so what we can we've got with it video weepies so I was watching one film I think it was called Inseminoid or something I said god this is a nasty film and uh, one of the directors said yeah let's call this nasties so we came up with nasties and then, but, and then uh, Evil Dead came up and so on, and the Holocaust zo zombies or whatever, and uh, the, the nasty thing took off. It wasn't Scanners one of them as well? Sorry? Scanners, that was one of Scanners another one, yeah, all done by Vipcom. I remember that started Duke Geese in the seminar, it was like sci-fi. That's exactly Duke right. Yeah. There was a rumour about Scanners, some a naval seaman had watched it or something and then committed suicide, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that, I remember, I remember that, that in the one. press. No, yeah, scanners are a film, isn't it? Yeah. And ask the more straightforward question, which is, has this film got distribution? Who was the first people to, to see it? As we say, we're, we're, we've just finished this cut, which we hope is as close to the final cut as we can get. Still a bit of look at work that needs to be done just to polish and tinker it. We want yeah. to try and make this deadline today. Check out the, today. the guy with a blue shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I mean, we would actually just say, sorry to interrupt you, uh, he's a very bad chance speaker, is my opinion. Uh, I, I found it difficult to understand what you're saying. And I noticed the sound levels when he was on seemed yeah. to bulk up and, and then drop down. Uh, and I thought, what the? It was obvious that when you sure, recorded it. You ever spoken with George? It was partly to do with that speaker, that JLP yeah. speaker. I'm going to fucking talk to someone tonight. I can feel it coming on, you know. Do you know what I'm saying? So it does the sort of things yeah, you've got to I just agree. polish up. Yeah. 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 yeah, one of the things we need to do is obviously so subtitle the film. you do need to be curious yeah. voice a bit. So. And uh, I think there's uh, some, one of the speakers might be blown. Yeah, it's basically blown. completely blown. gone, which didn't help us really at all. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, he didn't speak good English to start off, no. did he? No. Well, he spends most of his days. I mean, a week. I his, uh, do you know what impressed me about retirement. it? To be fair, was at the end because you know certain things were dragged down a bit. You know, like you'd have a three seconds of black or something. I, I'd have crunched that down a bit, but it was still good. Uh, was he got very emotional towards the end? Yeah. And uh, you think it, it, it's uh, as a filmmaker, 
it's free entertainment now, isn't it, really? Because he was just being himself. And he was cracking up, and I thought, you poor old cunt, you know, excuse me, French. But uh, uh, I thought, yeah, poor fella. Because I worked with him, and I, I met him, and all that, my dream. Yeah, it's interesting that from everything he talked about, there's a couple of moments where he nearly breaks when he's talking about the raid. Yeah. Uh, he nearly breaks them. But then when he talks about being on the right side of the law or his perceived right side of the law, yeah, yeah. that's when he actually finally breaks because he feels that that act of... Submission, you know, is it? Well, well, being heroic to yeah. save the life of the police officer when he's been fighting against the police for most yeah. of his life. He just can't seem to take it. Yeah. And he broke down. Simon said that moment when he was filming and he's crying. It's like, you know, where does this come from? Yeah. Because you look at him when he's recounting the murder of Orly, he's in your face. He's, yeah, yeah. He's the first and he was happy. Time he's, and he's really happy. Yeah, yeah. But well, it, stabbing it, that person just Well, he spoke to us about that. Him. Yeah. It was, uh, when he said stabbing, it was only a, a, a pen knife, but it made him drop the gun and all the rest of it. And uh, they, uh, he was a hero. He was a hero in, in Holland for a bit. And then they all went, what's he doing carrying a fucking knife in the first place? <laughs> And that's what set the ball rolling. Yeah, true. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, he appeared on a talk show apparently oh, for a short yeah, period yeah, yeah. of time. Um, and and his spiritual home is Holland. A few couple of years ago, he went missing in Holland. He left Italy. Told his um, partner that he had to go and do a lecture in Amsterdam or something, which was apparently a lie. Yeah. And he went missing in Amsterdam. And we thought we were going to have to go and track him down at one point because his, his wife rang saying Mike's missing. Um, but that's his spiritual home and I think that's where when he says that in the film if I was born in Amsterdam born in Holland would have led a completely different life no it's uh, no it's it's very liberal over oh you you don't feel like you're going to get your collar felt that was the reason I went over because in England you get your collar felt mm -hmm. do it for. so over in Holland it was very relaxed mm -hmm. but he uh, he wasn't a full quid at the best of times to be to be fair he was uh, Andy was a bit of a lad just a bit. Oh no, he he he'd fill you in sooner than look at you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, and he was. You you see him doing the pull-ups. I yeah. don't know how old he is. I think he's seventy-eight. Uh, and he was as fit as a butcher's dog yeah. when he was. There. I wouldn't like to have tackled him. To yeah. be, I'll be fair. And he still carries a knife to this day. <laughs> he still always carries a knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah and he's still as cantankerous as ever. Still as cantankerous as ever. Yeah. Trying to make a film at the moment. Trying with, with not much success on, from what I can gather, but. You know, he's he's still he's still fighting. Uh, it's what keeps him going, and the weed, I think, as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someone who's got the original copy of Rock and Roll Ransom is still in my storage. Company. We have been trying to track down a copy of that bloody film for. It'll cost you, baby. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. On the commercial angle, but the thing about the Bay City Rollers was is that uh, I would have liked to, as a journalist and media guy, I would like to send a bit more about. The Bay City Rollers to hype up what they were all about and how is it phenomenal this guy did porn films when he was actually in the Bay City Rollers. And I don't think you quite, if anyone's watched that today, he doesn't even know who the Bay City Rollers were. I do. Bye bye, baby. Yeah, you know, and you know, you know but I only want to be with you, etc., etc. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is Shang Lang, so we go on. But I mean, I was DJ in those days, so I know all of those songs. But um, what I'm trying to say is I think it might be a good idea to actually heighten what exactly how big the Bay City Rollers were. As it, the iconic thing of him making porn films, I think that that could have been emphasised a bit. Yeah, look, it's when um, when Lindsay Honey says uh, it's like the One Direction of one of the members of the One of One Direction of the day yeah. makes porn. Well, you know, I think you could have embellished that a bit more, mm -hmm. frankly, because I think younger people watching it really don't even remember that era. Uh, don't even know about yeah. that era. They might, I think they would be very intrigued to do a bit more of a simulation against the one direction. No, I'll take that on board, that's perfectly healthy. Yeah. I, I thought it's fantastic, I really enjoyed the film and, and knowing a lot more about what was going on. Uh, do you reckon this is the first step in getting them to a, a blue plaque? <laughs> <But> also, um, <laughs> uh, <No>. it's a murder. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, it's fantastic that the, the, the section around the gay film was in there, particularly how countercultural that was. And again, from my background, it's like, really, really exciting to see that. So yeah, it was very realistic as well, wasn't it? Countercultural. <laughs> 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 Those lines. <laughs> um, <laughs> Can I say something about that whole murder thing? Sorry, have you finished, Jason? Oh, well, last thing was, uh, and it said the end at one point in one of the. Yeah, I, that I was yeah. totally like, I was going to start clapping. I was like, it said the end on screen. I yeah, didn't know yeah, where yeah, it was. Yeah, I got, I got that, that's a new edition, yeah. 
confused me a little bit. Yeah. What, what I will say about the gay films is that yes. he doesn't get the credit for actually having the balls to make yeah. the hardcore gay porn in the early 80s. You know, these are feature length films for distribution on video. And he was making bisexual porn in the 1960s, in the mid 1960s. You know, he was, and um, SM porn as well. He was always been trying different things. I think a lot of it's because he saw the mar- there was a market and he's very much driven by money as you can tell in, in, I think in the interviews as well as being an activist as well but money was very important to Mike but it's amazing that he it's made these two features that no one ever thinks of Mike Freeman as being this pioneer who made two hardcore games. It was, uh, it was off the bleeding wall though. He really wasn't, oh, I've said he wasn't a full quid but uh, he really, he, he he, he was going to make a, a point of view movie with a camera on, on the partner's head and a camera on his head and whatever happened happened and it was art and that's the way it was going to be. George, are many of us a full quid even getting into the porn industry given all the stigma it involves? Oh yeah. 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 Well, You've got to have a, have a few quid missing, haven't you? I think so. Yeah, to be in this business. Well, I did be day in prison and fucked off to Amsterdam. Yeah. So he's, he's not even a pornographer and he's done time for it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, sure. sorry, sorry, Charlotte. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, did he meet the likes of Mary Millinder at all, or was that a different timeline completely? He was in prison for that period, so he was in right. prison for pretty much most of the 70s. So, so he, he went never to prison got to 69. Meet no, no. Right. That's very much like a, an absent period in my life where he spent about 10 years in prison for, for that crime of murder, murdering Jerry Hall and stabbing him 89 times in self defence. Apparently, <laughs> 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 that's what he said. Does anybody uh, hold it against Mike what he's done when he murdered that guy? <laughs> I mean, I, I got a lot of criticism for us giving him that award because of his murdering that guy. But that guy was a bad guy anyway. It sounds like it was him or the other guy. Yeah, yeah. he's going to get it. Well, yeah. He was worried about him and his family. I mean, I, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was, in, he was in the guy's house. He was in Mike Freeman's house as well, right, when it happened. Yeah. 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 So to me... His wife and, 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 ch- and children were in the one room, and in the room across was his um, his brother-in-law. Yeah, well. th- I mean, he isn't aware that he stabbed the man 89 times. But if he was in such a frenzy, <laughs> full of adrenaline, you're not going to count how many times you're stabbing a man, are you? Well, yeah. if we've seen the crime, yeah, eight, 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 nine, you can eight, justify eight, as much as you like. Time, yeah. but, yeah. but he didn't go to the cops, did he? He just forest, drove him down like in forest and dumped him. He's handsome at least. Oh, yeah, very civil. Come on. He's a nice gentleman. I'll tell you what, he's a bad lad. No, I'm not disputing that. I'll never dispute that. Well, you're giving him a fucking award, aren't you? Don't forget, it was a unanimous decision. No, it wasn't. Because I didn't fucking vote, you cunt. <laughs> no, I'm just not. All right, yeah, 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 sure. So, Ali, what's the matter? Oh, yeah, sorry, this gentleman here. A substantial point. Uh, I think I mean, events like this are good. I think um, anything that brings it into academic circles is good because I've never seen pro censorship arguments is in any way <coughs> intellectual. I went to the Goldsmith event um, uh, last year, which was also interesting. So, the, the, the anti censorship debate is now being brought into academic circles by good people like yourself. Well, um, one thing that rings true with this movement is the me. overall petty <laughs> nature. Basically, the persecution of people that have done nothing more than create entertainment for consenting adults. Now, we know we've got this argument about protecting children at the moment, but the one thing that people fail to realize is there's a thing called parental control. It should be, it should be parents that restrict what the children see, not the state. This is all about giving more power to the state. Well, that was mentioned in the film, wasn't it? Even yeah. back in, that, in the day, they were talking about protecting children and using that as an excuse for the, the same censorship. argument over and over. Oh, oh, it is. It's a contradiction, isn't it, really? Yeah. 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 Hey, listen, the kids are two clicks away from seeing it, and they know what they're fucking doing. Well, how do you control a child's hormones? I mean, I was having sex education when I was 13. I fancied you know, the teacher for years. That's it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, again, sexuality, <laughs> sexuality is a human need. You look at the psychologist like... like oh, um, dear, it didn't sound like I should go for something to me. It's a human I'm need. Okay. Without sex, it has an adverse effect on human <laughs> behaviour. Well, the, other, the other thing is, as well, that it seems that regulating bodies try and monetise they look at what is most likely to be human nature, where there's divide, 
and then they try and perpetuate that divide and find you for any misconduct surrounding that divide. This is just a subset of that. But it's universal across pretty much every single discipline. If you Google the word anti, you'll find an entire list of those sorts of things. I guarantee that they're almost all regulated and someone's taken it up. Mm. I think, yeah, there's they, they draw very arbitrary lines. And what's interesting is that most people are very interested in business, are interested in seeing how close they can go to the line. And then some people like Mike are interested in how much it, in crossing it just wants well, it's monetizing perception in simple sport. So if you can give someone a negative perception, you can monetize that to alleviate that negative perception. Things with what it is. Yeah. I mean, as soon as something's on the taboo side of the line, it becomes more profitable. Well, that's what I mean. Prison. Well, they can call it the what, it's, what, what made you even want to make this film in the first place? Um, and reading those books on Amazon, these self-published autobiographies, it just sounded so fanciful that there would be someone who would be, you know, have a hit put on them by the Metropolitan Police, they'll be taken on by the craze to take them out of the business. It sounded ridiculous. And yeah, the, 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 these autobiographies are, are, are really, they're really interesting because they're unlike anything I've come across. Not many people have written about British porn. There's little bits here and there, but no one's really talked about this history at all. And what I actually found is that Britain were pioneers in making porn. And we, we, we were the first people in the early 1960s to be distributing this material to Denmark, where most people say, well, Denmark and the liberalisation in, in Denmark, okay. that, that's what changed it all. Well, it did, but they were selling British porn films in the 1966, 1967, prior to the moment of liberalisation. So Britain, you know, we were key players in, in this field, and, and that's what drew me really. And I've always, you know, as I said at one of these events before, I used to bootleg porn in the 1990s when I was at school. It was a way to make a little bit of money. And, yeah, yeah, it was a way to be, it was a buyer's market. You know, you'd make a bit of money, and I've always had an interest in that, in how that was done. And so that's really what what led me to it, Terry. Um, and I, he wouldn't speak to me on email, but he'd speak to Simon, who probably looks the opposite to me in many ways, really, if you've met him. Um, and Mike, he went out there, interviewed Mike, and we got we got this footage. And it's it's of a moment, it's of a time. Um, as I say, he spends most of his days smoking weed. That's his hobby and drawing art, pretty much. It really is. That's that's, that's all he does. He spent. He was, Simon was the first male that he'd seen from Britain. He'd seen in like seven, six years or something. He's really isolated. Yeah, really he's just, weird. Yeah. Um, and, and we had this great story. We corroborated everything, as you can see from the newspaper articles, because it just sounded so ridiculous. But it, 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 this is this is true. He was one of a handful of people who were pioneers of making porn in Soho and distributing it in Soho. Has Mike seen the film? Uh, he it's with him at the moment. Whether he's had the time to watch it yet, I don't know. But we're all keenly awaiting his view. I'm not too sure whether he'll like it or not. Make sure he's not got his pen knife. Well, I did say that. Yeah, I hope he's not carrying. Uh, Ollie, are you going to be what, here what later? Uh, uh, what do I think his reaction will be? Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know. He, he, Mike is so unpredictable, as you can tell. He will stab you. <laughs> yeah. He totally fucking smack you. That's for do, sure. do it in a phone call. <laughs> I've been cogitating about Mike's mumble speech. Do you think maybe the idea could be to run? As in modern pilots on television, when you can't understand an actor, they run subtitles. On. Yeah, that, that is the plan. That is the plan. It's just yeah. subtitles are expensive and a time-consuming so activity. Old subtitles with, with black edging, so when it's on white background, you can see it because that's one of my big things. At the moment. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It, again, it's, it's a costly exercise, and yeah. budgets are so tight on this. We've spent four years on this now, so it's it's just time and, and, and coming out time and money. Probably the cheaper way around it, won't it? Oh, definitely. We need to do that, yeah. We okay. do need to do that. Thanks a lot. Got to go, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. Ollie, are you going to be here later? No, I've got to train oh, later. Right. Right. Catch up. Oh, yeah, definitely, George. Yeah. All right. George. What is the next step for all of this? What's the next plan for the film? Uh, distribution is the next plan. Just trying to find the right way to distribute it. Hopefully put it to a few festivals and see how it goes down there. Would you consider that at the end that you give a brief statement of where we are now with the law? 
just so that people's watching aren't left with because it's a little outdated to where we are now. Yeah. Just so that when it when it finishes, it's just before the credits to say that in 2019, this is where we are, so people are aware. Would you consider that? I think we need a bit of text on the screen at the end, potentially, yeah. and that might be one of the things that, that we have, just, just to finish it and just to say, you know, what Mike's doing now, really, and that could be a key part of it because, as I said, the same arguments, it comes around in circles, we're, we're having the same get rid of... Well, we did this argument in 2014, and then recently it's just been relaxed again, hasn't it? Yeah. So, I think like every what, Charlotte's yeah. saying is, what Charlotte's saying is you're missing an you're missing an interview with me and Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> if I could convince Simon to shoot more footage, I, I, I would because it, it's just taken so long. But that's a, one of the issues that we have is trying to track down some females to be filmed for the film because you, we can't track down many people from the 1960s because some of them are dead. Some of the names of the people who started these films are nameless films with no credits. You can't track them down. And when we did approach some of the people who started in the 1980s films, they just didn't want to speak to us. Paula Meadows wouldn't speak to us. Uh, you know, she's moved on with. She says she's moved on with her life at that point. So it's a it's a quite limited field of people that we could actually speak to. I mean, it would have been great when I asked previously about Mary Millington that within that gap of him going inside, that you could have had a brief snippet about what what was happening still ongoing in Britain, especially, and that would have been a Absolutely. female male yeah. role. Uh, female yeah. we did in the last cut right. but it just it's just it's too, too long. long it's too long we could make three films out of this yeah. all the footage that we have but it's well, why don't you do it in two parts problem. do it in two parts sell it to Netflix <laughs> um, we, you're, you're in a queue selling things to Netflix <laughs> uh, there, there is a key historic moment coming next month and I I think I mean I, I've had um, my second book kind of half ready to go for a long time but what's going to happen next month is going to change history and is worth sitting and watching to see what happens because it, it, it's going to shape. It's going to shape. It's going to shape. I agree. Yeah. There's one thing. Channel Four documentary on Snake One. I didn't watch it. No, I'm aware of it. So I remember they were filming when at the UCAP recent UCAP event. I think. Mm. Yeah, um, with that, then I saw it. I was thinking, oh, that was at that UCAP event, but um, I've not seen it yet. No, I don't get much time to watch things these days. Actually. <laughs> I didn't think enough was made of how. I know, I know you mentioned that the, the Bob Simple Publication Squad were dodgy, but I don't think enough was made. They were corrupt, corrupt. Yeah. The, the word corruption, I didn't he remember hearing the word corruption. Nor was it really clear that Vigo and Mer they went down. Yeah. Though one of them kind of won on appeal, didn't they, I gather? I, I think. Yeah, I don't I think, think enough was made of how. And how you know they used to raid the shops, yeah. and then you could next day you could go in and buy buy your stuff back. Yeah, yeah. And they were having screening parties of the pornography at Scotland Yard. And this is all factual evidence. It, it, it's it's unbelievable to think that you know they were, every Friday night I think was porn night at um, down the road at uh, Scotland Yard. You know that's and they had stock regularly go missing. That you'd have a bookstore be raided. The stock would be taken by the police. Then if you were paying a license, you'd have a phone call and say, would you want to come and buy it back? And they'd give you a tie to put on, and they'd march you through, so you'd have a Metropolitan Police tie to make you look official, and you go and you buy it back. It's, you know, it's I was one of the guys that supplied the Soho shops. Yeah, you were? Yeah, I was the copy of them. I just had banks of videos, and all I did, when they got raided, they just gave me a call, and I just delivered more tapes. There, there, there was a documentary itself to be made on the Dirty oh, Squad on that too. There was one made for Channel 4 a few years ago, it's on YouTube, which is really good, but it still doesn't really um, get get to that period of time when the, the, the police were underwriting the porn trade in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s. I think the other thing too, if I may interject to you as a film maker, if you'd have put too much in the film, it's like if you were given a lecture talking about anything that was the criticism you, you, of the last you, you come out remembering 0.5 percent so you try to get across the most poignant points i mean yes the police we older police are very nasty surprise surprise they are nasty bits of work i mean i saw the thing about mary millington uh, respectable and they interviewed a couple of um former psychopathic police officers in there you know who ruined this woman's life but didn't make them heroes but i think as as the, your colleague says it is a subject for another day and it'll a subject police psychopathy you know is I can, you know, I'm a, I'm a registered nurse, and I can tell you all sorts of attributes of psychopathy that are inherent in police behaviour. You know, there's a, there's a whole <laughs> realm. You know, I'm sure some of the people here will verify that. Yeah, put it this way: if, if I had a uh, doctor, I'd want to stick up, but 
police officers to know. You don't need to. Well, it's reinforced by the corrupt system. I mean, they, they lock people up for 12 hours and they call that an interview when you when you're interviewing. It's more, it's, I mean, I was in the army, did interrogation training. It's yeah. interrogation, it's not an interview, but they call it an interview. Oh, yeah, so they usually it's branded as exactly. Yeah. I think it's interesting that at one point the police were the ones that are regulating these licenses. And one of the questions that you did ask me was about do I think the industry needs to be regulated? Seriously? When you say the police are taking backhanders like that? I mean, you know, if you look at it today, you have to ask yourself, what, what are they regulating? Is it all about the money or is it really about the regulation? I, I, don't, I don't know. One of the interesting things that has come out from the film is that because a lot of those police officers grew up around the pornographers because they were from the working classes. You know, police officers rarely went to university in, in those days. They were from the work, so they were mixing with the pornographers. So that's almost what allowed that to take place because they, they knew what they, they they would know one another, um, and there was very little difference between a pornographer and a, and a police officer. I suppose in, in their in their backgrounds in that time. in the 80s and it was Saturdays was when the police and the football hooligans would fight each other and the same in Brixton it was when the rest of the police would fight each other and they were working class blokes having fun to some extent you know. and police wages were really low back then as well in the 1960s so taking a backhander was you know, would increase your monthly your weekly wage I think it's weird how everything was centred around Soho since the 60s through the 70s, 80s and even the 90s when I came about. It's just weird how it was all focused around there and, and how it was regulated because Westminster Council got involved, didn't they, at one yeah. point to regulate it. Yeah. And it just makes me wonder, you know, what were they really regulating? What well, were they regulating? Soho, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating space because you can easily get still get lost in Soho, if, even if you know it quite well, it's quite easy to take a turn and get lost, and it's quite hard to police, um, and that's one of, the, one of the reasons why the, 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 the police try to contain porn within this square mile. Um, because uh, you could control it, you know, well, it, it's, it's very much seen that season of The Wire when they like legalise drugs and they put it in that one square box. It's the same kind of analogy really, I suppose. If you look, if you put it in one space, you can keep an eye on it and you can try and control it, which is why the licences have clauses. So for example, you would not be able to go through a mail order because if you did, the police lose control. You'd have to send a copy of every porn film you made because Bill Moody, one of the police, was a big porn connoisseur, but also, they wanted to see what you were filming because they could control it, and that was the idea. And you'd work with the, the underworld as well, who would help to, you know, clip a few ears and throw people out windows if they weren't turning the line. And it was all contained in this space, you know. I also think it's quite fascinating as well that for all the films that were made about the craze, not once did they ever, uh, ever say that they were involved in porn. There's two mentions in books I found of this. The Richardsons were, yeah. and they talk about it. Yeah. But the craze, I only found two mentions of them being involved in porn. And when we are doing some of the archival research, I found, because this hit list thing, I just didn't believe it, but I actually found the prisoner talking in a police file about the craze hit list for the police. I thought, well, okay, you know, there's, you know, there's this clearly, this, this corroborates some of the things that have been said. Can, going back to the Soho part, in regards to the eras, where was it in, in regards to Paul Raymond in, the, in, in respect to the years, <coughs> the timing? Oh, I think Raymond was late 50s, early, early 60s. Right. Yeah, Walker's Court region around there. Yeah, um, I don't know on the end. And into the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Did they ever cross paths? Paul no. Raymond was in two Archer Street. I know yeah. I used to advertise yeah. their magazines. Um, did they ever cross paths? Yeah. I think Mike said that you know, he went to the, the club but, and he met, he met him, but they weren't on you know, talk speaking terms. In, in the 80s, the, there were a lot of Maltese gangsters in the The porn trade seemed to be controlled by Maltese gangsters. Yeah, I remember the Matisse Club next to Bar Italia. Um, there was a Maltese right. drinking club. Remember it? I, I, got, um, I got asked to do this um, catalogue of, I was a photographer, I did this catalogue of 
dildos and stuff, um, you know, what do you call it, sex toys and mm -hmm. porn paraphernalia. And um, yeah, there were there were a load of Maltese guys who seemed to, but most of Soho was controlled by by Raymond himself, who owned the freeholds on most of the properties. Mm. He yes, sure. up. He did, yeah. And yeah, Martin Thompson would be able to speak more about this because he's he's written a lot about um, Paul Raymond his control of the property, but also there's um, yeah, um, Bernie Silver owned a lot of the property as well, and he was operating well into like the late eighties, early nineties. Um, but yeah, the Maltese did seem to take over for a period. I think in the late seventies, um, early eighties, uh, and have and have greater con greater control. But the, the Maltese always had to stake in so dating back to the Messina brothers who um, taught Bernie Silver the, 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 the game, as, 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 he, as, as he says. Um, so they've, they've always had, had a place. Mike wasn't the only person at the time, was he? I mean, it, uh, no, no, not at all. But he, why is it he's the only one that became more prominent? Is it because of the book that he wrote? Um, this is like an, this is an underground trade, so not many people are willing to talk about it because it, it was illegal. So you've got the first person to make porn, the two, the two early people to make porn from what I can gather, a, a guy called Ken Taylor and a guy called Ivor Cook. And they were the, Mike talks about Ivor making these rollers, and we've seen police files from 1962 where the police are suspecting Ivor Cook of making obscene films. So 62, 63 seems to be this early period. Mike comes in around 65, 66, artwork, photos, then 8mm, and then he hires a guy called Evan Phillips, who the craze put him in touch with, um, who's a middle class guy, bit of money behind him, um, just around the corner from here is running a, an estate agent, Mike gets in touch with him and says, would you like to come to business with me, can you find a way to duplicate films, he starts to get in business with Evan Phillips, and Mike goes into prison for a period for making an obscene publication in 66, Evan Phillips takes over and becomes what the Sunday people call Britain's first blue millionaire um, through making 8mm films and moving to Denmark and, and starting a company there. But Mike's an, an interesting character because you know, he had a stake in starting the career of Jeff Phillips, Britain's first blue millionaire, if you believe the Sunday people, but also Lindsay Honey as well. And I think that's his, you know, he, he, he comes a, a, around in these key moments of the 8mm moment, the VHS moment. The fact that this was the first guy shooting films on video for distribution on video, carrying these massive cameras around, yeah. um, being the first person that we know of to do that for hardcore porn, no other, other people were doing that. There was one other filmmaker in the 1970s called John Lindsay who had a couple of shops in Soho, a Scottish guy, and he was he wouldn't make wasn't making films in the late 70s and early 80s, but he was releasing on VHS. Mike was the only one producing original content. It's quite interesting to draw parallels between back then because what he was doing with film was similar to what we do with uh, creating content on the web today. It's just the format was different. Yeah. yeah so he was a custom. He was what well, you, you could actually credit him with being the first um, custom clip creator because he made one-off films, didn't he? For people. Well, he was one of many people that were yeah. making those one-off films. But it's interesting again how we come full circle yeah. back to these like roller, you know, these fifteen-minute short roller clips. That's right. Internet back then. Yeah. They had so <laughs> So, I mean, would those films that they made back then, if you could get them today, would there be any value attached to them? Yeah, it's funny that you should say that because they rarely appear on eBay. When they do, there's about a handful, about two or three collectors who fight over them, and they then disappear into private collections, never to be seen again. Um, there are some people I know who have a small holding. I, I've had a few for the for the film, trying to get them transferred is a problem. It's such an expensive process. Uh, some archives. Mike has a holding of films at the Amsterdam Sex Museum. If you go to the Amsterdam Sex Museum, you can see his photos, and you can see some of his 8mm on the wall. The Kinsey Institute in Indiana, they have a collection of Mike's porn and British 8mm porn. So it's out there, but a lot of it is in these private close collections. And it's been writing this book that I'm writing at the moment. It's quite hard to, you know, to even get to see some of these. It's not on Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, the actual artifact where you can look at the film, the cover. You know, some of the stuff is on Pornhub, some of the stuff is on Exhamster. But for me, I, I'm not really interested in much as, as the content, as the way that they're presented, the way that they are made, the way that they were shot. And 
just look at the box covers of different styles. You know, the Brits were, the, from what we can gather in the research that we've done, were the first people to release porn on a branded, for a branded label. So Climax Films, which is a label sometimes attributed to Mike, sometimes attributed to either Cook and to Jeff Phillips, was the first label to distribute porn. And I just find it interesting that there's these 27 labels around by the early 70s that were distributing porn in Britain when it was legally problematic to distribute it. Yeah, think it's, um, so I've got a question at the back there. Yeah, I've just been thinking about having a play out soundtrack and I think Soho Needless to Say by Al Stewart to cover it. It's a really good song with brilliant lyrics and yeah, we sold it in the 60s with that solo. There's loads of songs we like but the cost of rights are so oh, expensive. Yeah, no, but he actually, I, I know Al Stewart and he's, he's quite good about it. Uh, okay. You know, you know so um, I'm just thinking that the lyrics of that song, just about of that, that fade out and the encounter with the lyrics of the song is just really epitomised what the whole film is about so hard. So. Yeah, that would be interesting if, if he's willing to do some big. That's definitely a Hollywood movie in this. Um, there's some people who've been sniffing around trying to make a Hollywood movie, but you know, Mike's quite quite difficult, you know, it's, as you can probably gather from the footage in some ways, um, and it'd be quite expensive to recreate so it would require quite a significant budget, but... Well, they do it all right with the deuce. We don't yeah. think we've got 10 years jump on the deuce. Yeah, well, we, we do, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think this, uh, the deuce is, uh, uh, I think it's, it's going to be in season three soon. Yeah, the last season. So, Maybe we should crowdfund uh, Soho. And yeah, also, they're yeah, making a movie yeah. about yeah. I think you'd get, you'd get a response. Yeah. I think you would. But to say this dichotomy, what I see as a dichotomy in, in understanding and interpreting what is and isn't obscene, in the movie proves it's quite arbitrary, like a statue in Italy, a new person, it is acceptable. Jesus Christ with a crown of thorns dripping blood is acceptable. We know the image of Western civilization for the last 2,000 years. And yet when it's done in the form of, of entertainment, it's illegal. So there's this dichotomy in, in people's interpretation of what is and isn't obscene. And, but I think that being said, putting things into a historical perspective, things have moved on. I mean, now we've got, we've got naked bike rides all over the UK. I mean, nudity is except more so perceptible than it was. Okay, it's seen as a bit of a laugh um, and it's quote unquote non-sexual. And yet a few years ago, you had the former Marine Steve Goff walking around naked. One individual was persecuted. He even went to, to court naked. But um, that guy's life was made hell. And yet when thousands of people go naked, it's acceptable. So it's, it's very psychotic. So it's easy money first, it's difficult money. That's all it comes down to. How long do I spend in court getting cash out of these people? Yeah. Versus that's an individual that can't defend themselves. That's it's very true. Money it's very true. Any more questions? I think we can round up then, I think. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.